talk about. Let's talk about being an ally. All right. So um, today we're going to talk about being an ally. But first, we want to mention I really appreciated um, that. Let me just hit one second. Um, if you do not see a PowerPoint in front of you, just unmute yourself and let me know before we get started. My new thing, I wait exactly five seconds for somebody to unmute themselves. Okay, good. All right, so everybody sees the PowerPoint. Um, so we're going to talk about being an ally today and a little bit about the Frederick Center. Um, we were founded in 2012. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, um, and our we basically exist to support the, L, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer communities or questioning communities and of Central Maryland. And so um, the organization was founded um, by a youth um, who was bullied at Urbana High School and his mother, as well as an individual who was at the time the chair of PFLAG, uh, which is Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. And uh, those three together decided they wanted to create a safe space for youth. And so they created a youth group, which has continued to meet to this day. Um, our youth peer group meets uh, weekly. It is ages 14, uh, 13 to 23, and it allows for the, opportun uh, the opportunity for youth to get together in a structured environment uh, with a facilitator as well as an LCSW um, to have uh, facilitated conversations and you know, do things like watch movies together, you know, fun stuff that they can do. So um, the, yes. Did, is everybody see it in slideshow view now? I'm sorry, I'm getting as I'm getting questions. Does everybody see it in slideshow? If you no, don't, Chris, see it. It, Chris, it looks like you're trying to edit it. it, and it says enable editing at the top. Gotcha. So that's why it's not okay. Let me redo that. Sorry, I have. It looks like it's in slideshow to me. <laughs> let me fix it. Hold on one second. Share. There we go. Enable editing. Nope. I know. Hold on one second. And all right, let's try this again. And then can you, yeah, perfect. There we go. All right, very good, sorry. So uh, thank you for that, for that catch and I just learned something new about Zoom today. Okay, so um, we also have, so from that youth group, we built out a number of different programs and support programs. The Frederick Center right now runs over 200 programs a year and um, including support groups for our youth group junior, which is ages eight to 13, as well as our young adult group from ages 18 to 25. We do have a transgender and gender expansive community group that meets on the third, um, meets actually twice a month now. And we have our trans family, which is for parents and caregivers of trans and gender expansive youth. And they meet every other Saturday. Um, and then we also have a support group for survivors of intimate partner violence and sexual violence. Uh, that we partnered with the Hartley House to put together. Um, so we have a variety of different support programming. We're probably best known for our annual event, Frederick Pride, which is down on Carroll Creek um, every year in June. This year it's been moved to October. Um, so the date is Sunday, October 4th. Uh, currently we still intend to hold on to Pride for this year. We will reevaluate as time goes on. Obviously with training being done online, all of our support groups are now being done online. We're proud to say that in a matter of about um, three to four weeks, we were able to launch all of our, all of our support programming online um, so that we can continue to provide support to LGBTQ youth. Um, our distribution of, we also do uh, free distribution of HIV test kits around Frederick County in, co in conjunction with the Frederick County Health Department. So uh, if people want to take home a test kit and actually test themselves at home, they can. So the big thing about questions is if you have a question, just unmute yourself and ask the question. I'm not going to be too terribly concerned about if you interrupt me um, because I don't want you holding on to those questions. When people hold on to questions, what happens is it's all they can think about is, oh, God, I got to ask that. I got to ask that. Um, and the big thing is, is if you have a question, regardless of what that question is, this is the space to ask that question. Don't take this time and, and not ask something that you might have heard or something you think, because this is that opportunity. When you have an LGBTQ person in front of you in a social situation, that is probably not the appropriate time to be asking questions about LGBTQ culture, um, but this specifically is designed to do that. So please feel free to interrupt, ask questions, and if you need clarification on something, feel free to, slow, uh, to have me slow down. 
We're going to be going through a series of three parts. Peter, please. So yeah, just to echo that, uh, well, as Chris has said, this is safe-based training. So if, if you think the question you're going to ask would sound transphobic or homophobic or inappropriate, don't worry about that in this space. Ask that question in this space. And if it is inappropriate outside of this space, then we'll let you know. So back to you, Chris. Thank you. So we're going to break this up into three sections. Uh, first, terminology, and then we're going to go into statistics, and then we're going to go into um, kind of community goals. Why is it important that we do all of this? Why is it important that you affirm uh, LGBTQ youth? And we're hoping that by the end of this, you get a better perspective, as well as you get some information maybe you didn't know about before. Um, so our first slide um, is very, is very uh, generic, right? This is uh, a lot of terms that you likely hear in society today that people use. Many of them have existed for decades, if not centuries, but let's go over some of them. So first is sexual orientation, which reflects our sexual attraction, um, which is often associated with our gender. So sexual orientation has to do with who am I, who am I sexually attracted to um, as far as their gender or gender identity. Um, Lesbian usually refers to women attracted to other women. Gay, gay can be a, a flip word. It can be to describe people who are attracted to their own gender, but it usually is defined by men who are attracted to other men. Um, bisexual, someone who's attracted to their own gender and other genders, and can be used as an umbrella term because the next term, pansexual, which is a very similar term that you'll hear, is someone who's attracted to people regardless of gender, meaning that they are both Binary folks, that is male, female, and non-binary folks. Those are people that don't, don't, don't ascribe to either male or female as their gender identity. And so by, some bisexual people define themselves as also attracted to non-binary people, people not associated with either male or female genders. Um, however, pansexual is the commonly used term. With that being said, if somebody calls themselves bisexual and they, they define bisexual in their head as dating both male, female, and non-binary folks, it's fine, they're bisexual. Um, really what it comes down to is how you personally identify. Nobody has the right to tell an individual how they do or do not identify. So, and then of course we have straight, uh, which is men who are attracted to women exclusively or women who are attracted to men exclusively, and asexual, someone who does not experience sexual attraction, but may experience emotional attraction. So we find that a lot in relationships with folks. Peter, please. So, so, so two notes I, I see, looks of terror. First, there's no quiz on any of this vocabulary at the end of the day, so don't worry about that. Uh, we're just trying to introduce you to the fact that, that, for example, asexual is a thing. So you don't have to memorize it or understand that, but we don't want you to be surprised if somebody comes to you and says, oh, by the way, I identify as asexual, as an example. And, and again, as Chris said, if you're, if you're not sure what that means or you can't remember or you don't have time to Google it, you can always say, tell me what that means to you, Peter, if you've just told me that, that I identify, if I just tell you that I identify as asexual. Uh, the, the second uh, thing is that uh, the reason why this, we start with this is that LGBTQ, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning, that, that's one phrase that describes really a series of minority populations. And so as a result, people who aren't in the LGBTQ plus community sometimes conflate sexual orientation with gender identity, when in fact they're different. They're different things altogether. So that's why we're starting with the definition of sexual orientation followed by gender identity. Back to you, Chris. Thank you. So um, it's important to note that these, um, these terms are they're, they're out there, but as Peter pointed out, there's a lot of them. Um, one of the things that I like to stress with folks is if you go to Facebook, um, when you sign up for Facebook, there are 72 separate sexual orientations and gender identities to select from. Um, and I can't name half of them. I can't, I, I can barely name a quarter of them. So, and you know, as a chair of an organization that's focused on this work, I can tell you it gets, it, the words get interesting, but the key aspect that we're going to stress throughout this whole training that isn't going to be terribly, you know, earth shaking is that um, if you just simply listen to the person who's talking to you and you respect them enough that they are able to make their own decisions about what their sexual orientation and gender identity is, you'll be fine. If you, if they say something to you, they say, if I identify as bisexual, I did not tell you I'm pansexual, right? It doesn't matter if you know what bisexual and pansexual means. At the end of the day, I told you what I am. 
And if you then turn around to me and say, oh, you're gay, well, then that might offend, right? So that's the key to all of this. That's the not earth shattering, not terribly complicated part of all of this. As we're going through some of this terminology, as we're talking about how to respect one another, the key is just to be deliberate, to make sure that you're listening to what the person does, says, I'm sorry, says to you, and then mirror that language back to them, because that's really the key to all of this, as far as creating safe and affirming environments for youth. So now we talk, so we talked about sexual orientation as Peter teed up. We're first talking about sexual orientation and then gender identity. So gender identity is how we individuals identify ourselves in terms of our gender. So cisgender, which is a Latin term, um, cisgender mean, means you are on the side of, meaning that a person whose gender identity aligns with their gender assigned at birth or sex assigned at birth. So I was assigned male at birth. That's the doctor said, I came out and the doctor said, it's a boy. I was assigned male at birth. I still identify as male. So I am a cisgender individual, the Latin term on the side of. Transgender person is a person whose gender identity is not aligned with their sex at birth. So if I was born, um, as if, if I was born and identified or um, assigned male at birth, and now I identify as non-binary, which we'll get into that term later, don't hold on to it, or as a female now, um, then I am transgender, which means on the opposite side of. Um, so, and then we have this term non-binary, and the word is a person who has gender characteristics and or behaviors that do not conform to, um, conform to societal gender expectations, meaning, that they don't necessarily identify as male or female, and that might show up in expression, how they dress, how they present themselves. They, there might be um, a mixture of male and female gender expressions in there. So you might see a lot of interesting clothing choices or hair choices, et cetera, um, for uh, non-binary folks. But the key is, is that they identify as non-binary. And so, um, meaning that they don't identify with one or the other gender. Now, the reason this is important is because, it's especially now, is because in the state of Maryland, uh, Maryland recognizes non-binary as a marker for driver's licenses. So you can mark yourself as male, female, or non-binary, which is M, F, or X. And um, so if you end up with, if you have a child in your home that is non-binary, it's important for you to recognize that there is um, state resources for those individuals um, to affirm their identity. And then you have agender. So we talked about asexual, so we wanted to include a note about agender as well. So this is a person who does not have a specific gender identity or recognizable gender expression. So simply put, they don't identify as non-binary, they identify as agender. And one of the things that we talk about again, and I'm gonna repeat this over and over again, is you wanna make sure that whatever the individual tells you is what you follow. So if they said A gender, you don't say non-binary because they are A different, but B more importantly, you are definitely going to respect what the person said to you and mirror that language back to them. More on gender identity. It's related to one sense of gender, not anatomy. We have this really weird, um, obsession in, especially in this country, above, uh, in most Western civilizations, with identifying anatomy with uh, gender. And a good example of, of the problems that are associated with that is that we have an entire population of people that are born without distinguishable genitalia. About 4% of the population in the world is born without distinguishable genitalia. So if we're so obsessed with identifying anatomy as gender, where do you put those people? And so this isn't, again, a terribly earth shattering concept, but gender is how you relate to what you feel inside, not how society has told you you are. Peter. Uh, and uh, more, more color commentary. Uh, uh, we Emotionally, I don't understand what it is to be transgender. And that's, and I don't, we don't expect you to emotionally understand that. All we want to do is make sure that we're all aware that there are transgender and non-binary people from an intellectual standpoint. And, and sometimes people get hung up over that as well. How, how could, 
how could a man, in other words, assigned male at birth, possibly uh, go through gender reassignment surgery and have his penis cut off and replaced with a vagina? How, how is that possible? Well, we're, we're here to share with you that that is possible and that it is a thing, but not necessarily expect anybody to emotionally say, I understand what that's like. Back to you, Chris. So, and gender identity can um, influence a lot of things about an individual, their expression, their jobs, their clothes, their roles that they play in society. Um, their, it basically it influences every part of who they are. Um, anybody who doesn't understand that a trans person understands that they're trans in society is crazy because um, trans people are reminded consistently of their gender um, in every aspect of their community and their and their and their and their livelihood, it's self-determined. Again, not externally decided, assigned. Um, an interesting side note is that there's some really breaking edge, you know, science on this, and it's showing that neuroscience is actually what creates our gender sense. That is how it um, how it's built in our brain is really what helps us design or, or, or assign ourselves a sense of gender. It, resi it resides in those brain structures. So it's not just a, oh, I made a decision one day that I'm gonna be trans or anything like that. It is actually built into your brain structure. And it can be fluid and move through stages. It's not static. So um, as anything can, and I stress with people all the time, if you don't think that you yourself have gone through fluidity, um, you obviously don't remember your teenage years because <laughs> everybody that I've ever spoken to um, especially as I always use my brother as an example to this, um, go through a series of different expressions and a series of different um, um, experiences, especially when they're moving through their teenage years um, and even into adulthood. He's in his 40s now and he continues to change his expression and what he wants to communicate to society based on his job and based on his dress and based on his attitude and everything else. It's all built into the pie. And so we stress with people that don't think of gender in a static like, oh, you are male or you were assigned male at birth and now you identify as female. And that's like a static continuum where we were, we were assigned male and then up to a point and then all of a sudden we identify as female and we're female from here on out. They can change and that's okay because it changes for a lot of people. Um, you know, my sister is a great example for sexual orientation. She, um, what, as a, a few years ago, came out that she was uh, gay for a while, and she started dating women, and then she came out again as bisexual, and she said, no, I want to date women and men, and then she came out a third time as straight, and she said, I want to marry, and she married uh, uh, um, a guy now, and who knows where that could go, but I have uh, plenty of examples of people my sister was young during that process, but I also have a close friend of mine that did the same thing in her 50s, um, went and came out as gay at 55, um, married a woman and lived wonderfully for a number of years. Um, they ended up getting divorced. She came out as straight in her at 60 and um, started dating a man again, is now married, living in another state. So this can happen to people throughout their entire lives, but it's important to note that um, that fluidity exists. And it's a spectrum, more of a galaxy than a non-binary, than a binary or continuum. So we have a tendency to think of gender identity um, and sexual orientation. So gender identity, male, right, and female, and everybody exists on a line in between. That's called a binary. So when we talk about binary, we're saying, here's male, here's man, right? Here's John Wayne, here's woman, Marilyn Monroe, and everybody lives on the binary in between, right? Some people are more feminine, some people are more masculine, but the point is that we have John Wayne and Marilyn Monroe and everybody in between. It's not that way. It simply isn't. Uh, people live off that binary and all over the place, like a galaxy of stars. It's amazing to look at, but also can be kind of challenging for people to wrap their heads around that there isn't just this male, female. There's also not just straight and gay. Um, there is a lot of determining factors around and a lot of spectrum around that. So the last thing we want to touch on is gender expression. So just to recap, we talked about sexual orientation, which is who we're attracted to sexually. We talked about gender identity, which is how we identify ourselves as. The final word is gender expression, and it's a little bit different. So gender expression is our physical characteristics and our behaviors and our presentation. It's how we present ourselves to 
the community. Now those, um, those expressions can have gender markers attached to them by society. That is, I could, if I showed up wearing a dress and my hair really long and wearing earrings and everything else, that might suggest a feminine right uh, uh, gender expression. So you might read those markers as being feminine. However, I might say to you, I identify as a male, in which case the identity goes first. Um, but the gender expression a lot of time is used by, especially the trans community to help them basically fit into societal norms of what the gender is they're trying to express to the community. Um, also their mannerisms and social interactions can be a big part of that as well. Who they choose to, um, who, who they choose to communicate with, who they choose to open up to uh, is another key thing about gender expression. Uh, Peter, do you want to add anything to gender expression? Okay. And so the easiest way to wrap all of this up is with a gender unicorn because unicorns are our favorite. So our gender unicorn is, um, let me just, I'm gonna drop this down so I can see, great. Um, so our gender unicorn is uh, basically the best way of identifying the differences between our gender identity, our gender, ex uh, our gender expression, who we are physically attracted to, that is our sexual orientation. And then there's a, there's a fourth section about who we're emotionally attracted to. I'm gonna just skip by that, but be, needless to say, who you're physically and attracted to are in your heart. That's why you see um, in here the heart uh, around, uh, around the heart. That's who we uh, physically feel emotionally attracted to. Our gender identity is who we are. It's in our head. We know what we are and who we are. Um, and our gender expression is all of this. It's how we, the signifiers that we use to express ourselves. And so um, that can help us to express ourselves as non-binary. It can help us to express ourselves as a, as, as a person aligned with societal norms of that individual gender. So some terms that you might hear, again, we, we kind of um, previewed this already, but there is a lot of terminology out of there um, for gender identity and sexual orientation. So a couple of them are listed there. Um, don't feel that, again, there's going to be an exam on this. Uh, there is not, um, but the key to understand is that you're going to hear a lot of terms. And so if you hear that term, just remember to reflect it. Um, and then we have um, a few other terms, especially for our trans community with gender identity. You notice that I said that I was assigned male at birth and I now identify as a male. That's a key term for especially our trans community, understanding that you don't really say to a trans person, oh, you were a right? Because that makes it who they are. Um, instead, they were assigned X at birth, meaning that it wasn't really in their hands to start with. Um, it's not like they came out of the womb and said, hey, I'm a blank, right? They were assigned that, that, that gender that they don't identify with now. So we want to be careful of saying, what were you originally? Or, you know, what did you, you know, how were you born? Um, those things can be terribly, um, uh, 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 um, triggering for a trans individual um, to have to be reminded that they're somehow different than who they believe they are or who they are inside of themselves. So um, I'm going to quickly go through this, but just needless to say, the key ones to focus on are she, he, and they. Those are the general agreed upon um, pronouns that people uh, use when people introduce themselves. Then they say, you know, my name is Chris and I identify with he, him pronouns. That means that I identify with uh, masculine pronouns, he, him, his, himself. Um, and other people can use other pronouns. Now, um, if the person says I use she, her pronouns and you feel that that is a trans woman, it is terribly offensive to use he, him pronouns. Um, we're gonna get into you know, what to do when you use the wrong pronouns with somebody. Um, but then we have the non-binary pronouns, which is they, them, which uh, you might be hearing a little bit more about in society nowadays. Um, it's important to note that that is um, the agree that that is the uh, respected language of non-binary folks. They will say, "I prefer they them pronouns." That means they don't identify with male or female necessarily pronouns. They would like to use gender neutral pronouns, they and them. Now, if any of our folks in the audience are English majors, obviously you're gonna go, well, gee golly gosh, that's not correct. 
um, to use a plural pronoun with as a singular, but it is actually correct. Um, and you can go back and check and not to mention Oxford Dictionary just updated itself and said to clarify that they and them are singular pronouns, can be used as singular pronouns. Um, so I want everybody to just get comfortable with those three. The last one, Z and Zir, you might hear it, you're not very likely to. So that's why I try to get people to focus on what is critical here. Um, she, he, and Z obviously is a non-binary version of she and he. So it's the easiest way to remember it, but you're not, like I said, you're not likely to hear it. A non-binary person is much more likely in today's society to use terms like they and them. So make sure you focus on just listening. Did they use she, her pronouns? Did they use he, him pronouns? Or did they use they, them pronouns? So again, more on um, LGBTQ+. Um, we say we're an organization that respects the LGBTQ plus community because it is a large, wide ranging community of various uh, uh, sexual orientations and gender identities. And as you can see, each identity gets its own flag. So if you join a community, you get to have your own flag. Hooray! So now people who say, you know, how can you have so many flags for this community? The answer is very simple. We have a flag for everything. I'm a fraternal, I'm on the Fraternal Order of Eagles. We have our own flag. You know, people who serve, uh, you know, at, at the, the Orioles Nest, they have their own flag. You know, everything in society has its own flag. So, um, you know, the fact that individuals with their sexual orientation, gender identities want to have a flag to re represent their, their community is not terribly or shattering either. Um, the LGBTQ, I will make a quick side note here on uh, Q. There are caveats to the use of the word queer. Um, Peter, uh, I think, speaks very well to this issue with the word queer. Um, a lot of people in our community, especially our younger LGBTQ plus community, have recaptured the word queer as an empowerment term. Um, they refer to themselves as queer. It's a way of not saying, hey, I'm not lesbian, I'm not gay, I'm not bisexual, I don't identify as trans. Um, I want to identify as queer, which is a much larger spectrum of folks and able to cover many, many more of those terms that we were talking about earlier in one central word, which is queer. But Peter, speak to the opposite side of queer. Well, for a lot of people who are older, like me, uh, that word was used before we were verbally or physically assaulted. So it has a lot of triggering uh, moments to it. So again, just, just be careful. If, that, if the person identifies themselves as queer, then that's great. And if they identify themselves as gay or lesbian or bisexual, then that's great too. But just, just be cautious about leading with that word. Yep. So a few other notes. Uh, transgender person instead of a transgender, again, it is who they are. It is not a, it's not an adjective for them. Um, say transgender instead of transgendered, right? It's not something that happened in the past that is a present thing. They identify as a transgender male, transgender female, et cetera. Um, avoid terms like biological sex, instead use gender assigned at birth. Um, we already talked about that. And it's important to note that um, gender affirmation, which is affirming the gender that I internally believe that I am, um, that is people saying to me, yes, you are, that is gender affirmation. It can include three distinct areas, really. There's a social piece to it, which is name, pronouns, dress, hair. There's a medical, there's a medical section to it, hormone therapy, electrolysis, voice surgery, top or bottom surgery. Um, and then there's a legal, which is changing the name and gender markers on social security, driver's license, passports, et cetera. So the question is, is do you have to do all of them in order to be a trans individual? No, you can do any of them or none of them. A lot of people can't afford to do a lot of these, uh, these pieces uh, of the puzzle in order to um, really affirm who they are. The point is they tell you, I am a trans male, trans female, um, or they tell you they're non-binary and the key is to respect that. And the other note that I'll make is that it is not appropriate to ask hey, have you had top surgery or bottom surgery yet? Have you done electrolysis yet? Have you, have you changed your um, driver's license yet? None of that is really, you know, our information to have. Um, it is their choice to share uh, with individuals. It is not our place to ask those kinds of questions because if you just think about it on a very baseline level, you will not ever hear people ask these kinds of questions of individuals 
in a straight or cisgender relationship. Um, so when you go out with your friends, you do not talk about um, you know, their genitals or you don't talk about their um, sexual experiences or you don't talk about what invasive surgery they might've gotten, right? We don't get into those details with people society, but for some reason with trans, uh, with trans people and with sexual orientation, people feel like all questions are free game. Um, the point is, if you don't need to know the information, then you shouldn't be asking the question. The people who need to know that information are people like medical doctors and people like um, therapists and other medical-based fields. Those are the critical people that need to understand that information. Everybody else, you know, just wait, Google, research, and if they feel confident and comfortable enough with you, they'll probably share some more information, some more personal details with you. All right. Um, so I'm going to fly through these statistics pretty quickly because I know I'm running by. Maureen, am I supposed to be done at 1 or 1.30? One 1.30, sorry. Okay. Just yeah. want to make sure. I want to make sure there's enough time for questions. So I'm going to move through these statistics pretty quickly. But just so you understand the scope of the community, um, estimates of adults in the U.S. who identify as LGBT are 4.5% in 2018. Now, it is critical to note that that number was 3.6% just five years ago, which means two things. One, the population is being underrepresented as far as the actual number of people who are LGBT in this country. Two, the reason why that number is jumping so quickly is, has a lot to do with the fact that society is becoming much more open to this discussion about especially sexual orientation. If you look at the cross tabs of these studies, you'll see that a majority of that percentage jump is with sexual orientation because gender identity is still decades behind where we're at with sexual orientation as far as supporting people. So um, the key is to understand it is a large population and it is much larger than even the statistics are showing currently. So, but using 4.5%, that means we have about 11 million adults in the US, 0.6% um, identify as transgender or 1.4 million people in the country. 20% ages 18 to 34 identify as LGBT in 2017. So it's also an issue of, you can see that with younger adults, they are feeling much more confident and comfortable with coming out as who they are. They're not willing to simply hide their sexual orientation and gender identity um, just be, because they're not running as high, I will say still a very high risk of, of violence, but they're not, they're not running as high of a risk of violence. Um, more than 1 million LGBTQ people are veterans and 71,000 currently serve in the US military. And we always like to mention, transgender people are twice as prevalent to be in the military as the general society. 1.2 to 1.4% of members who identify as trans serve in the military versus just 0.6% of the general population. So it is important to note that they also want to serve our country. Um, in Maryland, in a recent study, 4.2% self-identified as LGBT. That would equate to roughly 270,000 LGBTQ residents. Frederick County would have over 10,500. And it's important to note that in a recent youth behavioral risk survey, it found that with 20, it found that 20% of Frederick County Public School students identified as LGBTQ, I'm sorry, my apologies, 18%, which equated uh, to approximately 8,400 students out of the 42,000 that are in the school system. These are some great pictures, by the way. Frederick Pride's the one on the far left. You have um, a, the city, city of Frederick's uh, uh, proclamation announcing June as Pride Month, a group of people there, and a few other pictures of Frederick Pride there. Uh, that is all local photographs, which is wonderful to see. Um, so youth, uh, we want to mark why this stuff is so important, talking about affirmation and just at least trying to be supportive. Um, because 62.9% of lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth felt hopeless in the last year, which is a suicide marker. All of this data is from a youth behavioral risk survey that was done in 2016. We just recently got the updated data uh, for 2018, and I'm dismayed to report that this really did not significantly tick down at all. Um, individuals, the, these statistics are almost the exact same, um, which is sad because that means LGBT people still feel hopeless, scared. They will, well, we'll get into the rest of them in a moment. 
46.5% of LGB youth seriously considered suicide. 34% um, um, reported bullying. 14% um, were threatened or injured with a weapon on school property. And you can see that the variation of people who are lesbian, gay, and bisexual versus the straight community, the, the percentages are double to triple. Um, now, this report, uh, unfortunately, did not track our gender identity community, meaning they did not track trans people or non-binary people. Generally speaking, whatever the statistic is for lesbian, gay, and bisexual people, it is usually substantially worse for trans people. Um, so we are going to pull a couple of details for trans people from other national studies, uh, but it's important to note that the state of Maryland's, uh, the, the Maryland Education, um, uh, Maryland, whatever, MSEA, Maryland State Education Association, simply forgot to track trans people at all, which is a marker all by itself about how trans people are erased from society. 40% um, of homeless youth are LGBTQ. Straight and cisgender youth are perceived to be LGBTQ are at the same risk. Meaning that that last one's really important, Peter. Uh, just to reinforce, that's that's why we really appreciate your participating in today's session, because there is a high likelihood that the young adult who you will be hosting will come from the LGBTQ plus community, mm -hmm. and it's because when when a child comes out, many many times the parents or the caregivers say, "Get out of the house." And that's true of foster families as well as biological families. So the child ends up in the system. And, and again, once in the system, it's hard to get out of the system and hence the importance of the Thrive program and, and your role in it. So uh, back to you, Chris. Thank you. And, and from a local perspective, I will mention that in the last two years, the Frederick Center has been personally involved with about a dozen uh, LGBTQ homelessness cases um, where the individual was kicked out after they came out. Uh, with their, uh, for their sexual orientation or gender identity. They were literally kicked out of the house and disowned by their family. Um, now that is of the people who were able to find our resource, contact us and get a hold of us. As we know, the vast majority of homelessness cases in this country go underreported because we cannot see, they, did, they do not have access to the resources so that we can see them and find them. Um, and without a really thorough and robust um, uh, uh, you know, study of going out and finding those people, um, they continue to struggle and suffer. But I did want to mention that on a local level, even on a Frederick County level, we still see that kind of homophobia and transphobia. Um, straight and cisgender youth are perceived to be LGBTQ or at the same risk. That simply means that you don't have to be gay or trans or non-binary in order to experience these feelings of hopelessness at this rate or seriously consider suicide. If society has pegged on you um, in school that, you know, oh, you're gay or whatever, that simple act of society bullying you and making um, a, a, a presumption about who you are um, is enough um, to create a really, really terrifying set of outcomes for, for youth. Um, so it is really a critical matter for LGBTQ youth that we uh, work towards becoming a more enlightened and educated society when it comes to sexual orientation and gender identity. But it's also uh, critical for our straight and cisgender youth, that is the people that don't identify as LGBTQ, because just the assumption that you are um, uh, by society can put those, those markers in place, which is really scary. Um, Family rejection is the single greatest predictor of involvement in the juvenile justice system, period. 39% of all homeless LGBTQ youth were arrested each year, are arrested each year. 13 to 15% of all youth within the juvenile justice system are LGBTQ. Um, as you saw with an earlier note, um, they identify as, uh, we are currently at 4.8%, right, of society, 13 to 15% in the juvenile justice system. Survival activities lead to criminalization and further trauma. So survival activities, um, I can just share a quick story, is a friend of mine uh, was rejected when he came out as gay from his community. He was publicly shunned. He was part of a Mennonite community. He was publicly shunned, meaning that whenever you walk down the street now, everybody has to turn their back to that individual. Um, he, he was kicked out of his house with nowhere left to turn. He moved to Washington, D.C. Um, he had 
little education, no support, no money. So he naturally turned to sex work as a way of survival. Um, and that individual um, has been dealing with those lifelong um, forced decisions that were put on him um, now for decades. And um, it is, we, we all don't know what we will do to survive um, it, when everything is taken away from us. And we have no support systems in place and we have no other structure in place. But if we want to avoid those situations from happening at all, all we have to do is start by supporting individuals. So many risk lifelong classifications as sex offenders. Um, Peter, if you can, I, I always fumble that one. Can you explain that one better to people? Well, but somebody who's caught up in sex work uh, usually has this appended to their record. And of course, if you're classified as a sex offender, you can end up in all kinds of bad places as it relates to housing and employment. So it further uh, creates a, a spiral down. Um, transgender. So these are national statistics. I'm sorry, statewide statistics from Free State Legal, which is the legal arm of the LGBT community in Maryland. Um, according to their study, 81% of trans kids in K through 12 reported harassment. 38 physical uh, of physical assault. 16% sexual violence. 6% reported harassment so severe that the student left school. And one in two transgender children will have attempted suicide before the age of 20. The greatest, I'll, I'll mention there's one statistic that's not on here. The greatest predictor of a trans youth's uh, suicide rate is their affirmation. The HRC released a statistic that uh, the, re the percentage of trans individuals that will attempt suicide when they are not affirmed, that is when they come out and they are rejected by their family and friends is 56%. That number, when affirmed, drops to 6%. So if you do hear people in society that say, oh, trans is a mental health issue, right? These people suffer from mental health problems. That statistic all by itself tells you that, and I'm sorry, it's not 6%, it's 4%, that the suicide rate of trans individuals drops to that of the standard rate for the rest of the population simply by being affirmed, simply by being supported when they come out. It is, it is literally as simple as that and cut and dry as that. So just bear that in mind as we talk about these issues and you hear some of, you know, some of the common misconceptions. Um, a little bit about drug and alcohol use. Um, it's important for you all to note that these are called, these are called coping mechanisms for a reason. Um, and anybody who suggests that alcohol uh, isn't a coping mechanism, did not grow up in my family, <laughs> where, where the, every time a recession or a depression hit, like, uh, you know, everybody turned to alcohol in my, in my, in my extended family. I grew up out, out in uh, Ohio and, and, and Pittsburgh and West Virginia. And um, so I saw this all the time. So it's not illogical to me that this is a coping mechanism for LGBTQ youth who are constantly being bullied, threatened, harassed, and feeling that they should be something different than who they are. Um, so you can see some of those horrific studies, I mean, some of those horrific outcomes, which is that they're more likely to drink, they're more likely to use tobacco, they're more likely to use marijuana, they're more likely to take prescription drugs, they're more likely um, to have higher levels of depression and engage in sexually unsafe behaviors. And again, all of this ties back to, they, they are trying to cope with what society has put on them. Um, according to the Fenway Institute, which is an organization outside of Philadelphia, outside of Boston, um, that supports uh, LGBT people in the medical arena, among LGBT people, 39% are rejected by a family member or friend, 30% um, are threatened or physically attacked, 21% treated unfairly by an employer. So it literally comes from all angles. It comes from family, it comes from friends, it comes from employers. So you basically, I'd hate to say it, but just imagine those three concepts together. You can never get away from it, right? And then amongst trans people, 61% reported being physically attacked and 55% lost a job due to bias, meaning that they simply lost their job because they are trans, which is horrific to me. Um, Again, LGBT patients report that providers use excessive precautions or refuse to touch them, um, which is 11% of the population. Um, they blame them for their health status, um, which, and then they use harsh or abusive language. 
And that can come in all kinds of different varieties uh, of harsh and abusive language. Um, when I was at a medical appointment a few, about a year and a half ago, I went to a cardio, uh, cardiologist. And during that meeting, which is by the way, why I can't have starch now, Thank you, cardiologist. But one of the nurses um, was telling me that I needed to watch my diet, and they said, "You know, you you know, you need. Are you married?" And I said, "Yeah." And they said, "Well, you need to make sure that your wife tells you keeps stays on top of you with this." And I said, "Ha ha ha." Well, it's my husband, and he said, "Right, your wife." And then, so the question all of a sudden, I'm sitting there, shirt off, right? They have all these things hooked up to you, so you're in a very vulnerable state all by yourself. And I'm having this moment of like, was, did, did, did he hear me? Did he not hear me? Like I said, I said, husband, I know I said husband. Um, did he choose not to hear me? Was, is he, a, you know, is he homophobic? Does he have problems with gay people? I was like, I, all this is going through my head. And I'm like, I don't know what to do here. Like, do I stand up for my civil rights or do I, do I try to brush it off? Do I ignore it? Like even myself as a person who works in this work on a daily basis, we struggle because things like this happen to us. Now, I will say that I decided to mention husband again, and must have said husband about a hundred times back to back to back in order to get the point across to him. And I think that it was just a simple incident, but it shows you that society puts social norms on you without even thinking about it. He just assumed that I was married to a woman. He never bothered to ask, he never bothered to understand. Um, but once he got it, he was fine. So, but the point is he shouldn't have assumed in the first place. That kind of harsh language really kind of can be jarring for an individual. Um, and then transgender patients report being harassed in offices and being flat out denied medical care. We have anecdotal evidence that is stories written by countless trans individuals who are going in not just for basic medical care, but really life-saving medical care and are turned away at hospitals, primary care physicians' offices, um, individual doctors saying we won't treat them, nurses who say they can't possibly be expected to help um, in all kinds of scenarios all over the country. Um, health disparities, um, they have, uh, LGBTQ adults have higher levels of HIV and sexually transmitted diseases. They suffer from anxiety and depression, suicidal ideation and attempts, substance abuse, smoking, and a lack of peer or family support, which leads a lot of times to homelessness because when all of society cuts you off and you can't get a job and you can't survive, you become homeless, you can't turn to somebody for support. I keep joking with, well, not joking, but I keep telling Peter during our conversations, like I've had multiple friends just in this situation. I've become unemployed much like rest, the rest of the country during this coronavirus. I, I am very lucky because I have a massive level support system in place all over the county and country multiple people have already said, hey, look, you know, if you have a problem financially, just let me know, we'll, we'll slip you some money um, to get you through this, which is nice, I didn't need it, but it's nice to know that it was there. I, for most LGBTQ people, they don't have that ability or support system in place. And most of the people who are their friends are in the same exact financial situation they're in. So if they got laid off, so did all of their friends. So they don't, they don't have the means or capacity to be able to support each other which is really terrible and sad. Um, there are social and political challenges, obviously. Um, this conversation about if you've heard of conversion therapy, that is where individuals are convinced that you can pray the gay away or make people so that they're not who they are. Um, that conversation still happens in this country and there are still states that allow that to happen. Um, some of the methods that they can use include electroshock therapy, they use um, countless levels of, of, of shame and, and, and really disastrous, uh, 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 which leads to really disastrous results. That is spikes in suicide, spikes in um, attempted suicide and depression and lifelong um, PTSD from these kinds of experiences that people are forced to go through in conversion therapy. Um, legal discrimination is very common. Um, that and gender identity or expression. And like we said, in Maryland, they just now allowed for non-binary markers, which means people who identified as non-binary were forced into a box that said they were on the binary, that they were male or female, which really makes people uncomfortable. Uh, yeah. just, just to build upon that, 34 states uh, currently allow terminating somebody because of their sexual orientation mm -hmm. or gender identity. 
Fortunately, Maryland forbids that. So it is against the law to discriminate based upon sexual orientation or gender identity in Maryland. But that's not true in states like Arkansas and Texas. So back to you, Chris. Thank you. Current administration bans on trans service members that came out in 2017. That was a huge blow. I know that a dear friend of mine was the top ranking trans individual in US Armed Services. Um, she served in the Navy, she served proud, and she left the Navy because of that ban. We, we were actually losing active service members to the US Armed Services to that service ban. Um, legislation allowing refusal of service based on moral objections. Peter was talking a little bit about that earlier. That is people saying, hey, I don't wanna have to serve LGBT people because I have a religious objection to it, um, regardless of whether or not they can prove that. Um, think of what that means as far as society goes. Think of the slippery slope that is. We can decide we have a moral objection to serving anybody. Um, and we could come up with some ridiculous reason why. And it's it, for people that say, well, that's really far-fetched. It isn't. We have used religious objections to deny service to countless individuals for countless reasons beyond sexual orientation and gender identity over the years. And we've always found that to be a flawed process or fault, flawed uh, uh, and dangerous um, concept. And we have denied it at every turn, um, except for when it comes to LGBTQ people now. Increasing the number of hate crimes against LGBTQ people. So we've seen a rampant increase in the number of hate crimes in the last couple of years. So we've been tracking that very closely. Um, we're seeing a reversal in the polling numbers. That is, uh, they were, there was a big uptick in the support for same-sex marriage, as well as for people who are trans to be supported in society. Um, that number has been slowing down and in some cases reversing in the, in the percentage of public support. And there's a lack of school policies requiring equality for trans and non-binary youth. We're proud to say that in Frederick County Public Schools, due to the work of especially trans students who had to fight for their own rights, we have a very affirming trans policy called Policy 443 in Frederick County Public Schools. The Frederick Center's key role in all of that has been helping the school implement that policy for the, for the teachers, educators throughout the county. What we wanna make sure is happening is that the uh, student feels affirmed for their gender because we know from all those suicide marker notes, depression, um, physical violence, everything else, that if we begin the process of affirming individuals inside of the school system, those rates will all drop precipitously. So we want to be very cognizant of our policies towards students inside of school systems. Did I see a hand raised? Was that a hand raise or a stretch? <laughs> Due to, um, all right. So why are the stats so grim? It's called minority stress. I know everybody's like, oh my God, it's another term. Yes, it is another term, but there's a term for anything, folks. I didn't know what social distancing was prior to a few weeks ago, <laughs> but that's apparently a term now that we all know. Social distancing is a real thing. Minority stress is a real thing. Um, and it's all of that stuff that I just talked about, the stress of being in the minority of a population and being um, subjugated by the population because of that being in that minority position. Um, it's caused by lack of affirming laws, affirming families, affirming therapists, affirming medical establishment, affirming schools, affirming churches, affirming governments. Can you think of more? Like think that is everywhere you turn. You can't go to church, right? You can't go to your government in many cases and many governments, especially municipal and state governments across the country, as Peter mentioned, 34 states still say that it's fine to fire somebody because they're LGBTQ. Um, schools, you can't go to school and feel safe. You can't go to your doctor and feel safe. You can't go to a therapist and feel safe. Um, you can't go to your family and feel safe. So what does that leave for a person who identifies as LGBTQ um, as far as um, where they can go to feel safe? And the answer is, in many cases, nowhere. So what does affirming mean? Um, affirmation, we've been talking, I keep saying this word affirmation, so here's the actual definition of affirmation. It means to actively and visibly offer someone emotional support or encouragement. So to affirm somebody is to say to that individual, we understand what you just said to me, you are this person, and I affirm who you are. I believe, understand, and provide want to support you in what you just told me. Yeah, to build upon that, uh, 
well, sometimes people say, well, I accept LGBTQ plus people. I, I, it's, I'm, I'm fine with them. And, and I guess what we're trying to drive for is acceptance is a handshake, affirmation is a hug. And we just, we want more, more affirming hugs along with those handshakes. So back, back to you, Chris. Peter's way better with the sound bits. So take, take that away. <laughs> Acceptance is a handshake, affirmation is a hug. Um, so this is kind of the level, this is how we kind of track affirmation, how we get to affirmation. And it's important to note a few of these in, in that process. So um, going through my life, uh, for example, the first one that I experienced, well, we've, we've always experienced a level of repulsion in, in society from the community where we're treated as strange and adverse. But really the first place when I started working in LGBT um, uh, advocacy work was we lived in this world of tolerance. That is, people are LGBTQ, um, but uh, we're going to tolerate that they're here, right? That's kind of that we love you despite your sinful lifestyle kind of attitude. We're going to tolerate your existence. Um, acceptance says we are a fact of life. We're here and we understand that you're here. It's not good or bad. We just understand that people exist. That's where acceptance is. And that's the problem between acceptance and affirmation. Support says we believe that LGBT people should be protected and safeguarded. And it moves through admiration and appreciation, but really that key word again is affirmation. LGBTQ people are an indispensable part of society. And if you haven't heard this argument yet, um, I make it all the time. I tell people in LGBTQ culture, uh, every if you don't think that you have worked with or been associated with an LGBTQ person, you are completely incorrect. They are in every aspect of society. I guarantee you have worked with more than one LGBT person in your lifetime. Um, affirmation looks like respecting an individual's names and pronouns. So if I come in today, dressed exactly as I am now, right? Polo and, and jeans and a belt. And I say, hi, my name's Chris. And I identify with she, her pronouns. Despite your greatest you know, intuition on the issue, I said I use she, her pronouns. So if you reference me, you should use she, her pronouns. Um, introduce yourself with your pronouns is a great way to do it. You can just simply say, hi, my name's Chris and I use he, him pronouns. If you're not sure, right? Let's say you walk into a room and you're like, I, I don't know if that person's trans or not and I don't know how to ask anything, so I don't know what to do. If you walk in and lead the conversation, which is what, you know, Peter and I, I'll be honest, folks, a couple of years ago, we were never talking about this, but, and it's taken some time to get used to, but the more I do it, the more comfortable it becomes, where I just walk in and say, hey, my name's Chris, I use he, him pronouns. It doesn't mean anything, it doesn't offend anybody. Um, I don't ask them for their pronouns. I just say, I use he, him pronouns. And if they wanna share their pronouns with me, perfect. Then at least I have their pronouns. If they don't, you shouldn't look at that as a slight. You shouldn't say, hey, 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 I showed you my, I, I gave you my pronouns. How dare you not give me yours? And they are welcome to do whatever they would like. So they might share it with you. They might not feel safe to share it with you, right? We deal with a lot of people in, the pop, in, in our population who have employment that they're scared that they're gonna lose their job if their pronouns, if, if it's revealed that they're trans or non-binary, or the individual might not understand the question. They could be cisgender, and they're just like, I don't get what they just said to me or why they said that to me, but it's fine. If you didn't get their pronouns that time, um, use their name. That's what we talk a lot about, using people's names instead of pronouns. Um, do not ask about or comment on body parts or surgeries. We talked about that. Do not use their dead name if you know it. Now, dead name is a, is a term that has been adopted by the trans community to really identify that name that they were assigned at birth because usually one of the aspects of the trans community, and this isn't true in all cases, but in the trans community, one of the common aspects is that they identify with a new name. And that old name, they do not want to be, they don't want to hear people say, hey, what was, uh, what's your real name? That's a common question that trans people get. What's your real name? Or what's, and the point is, it doesn't matter. They gave you their name. You know, if I told you my name is Bob, here today, um, but my real name is Chris, or my name here is Chris, um, but I tell you my name's Bob, why does it affect you to call me Bob? Yeah. Exactly. 
Yeah. Actually, we, we have a history of that. Uh, somebody who was born uh, Maurice wants like, to be called uh, Buck as an adult, or uh, his name was uh, Richard Smith III, and he wants to be called Junior. So we have a tradition of using preferred names anyway. This is just an example of how that works out with the trans population. Thank you, Peter. Um, practice pronouns even when the person is not present. If you make an ex if, now this is the key sentence here. If you make a mistake, all right. I have a lot in this work. I've known a lot of trans people um, before and after transition, and those are usually the hardest for me. Is the ones that I knew uh, before and after transition because I have to change pronouns. Um, there's a few. The, the key thing is that when you misgender somebody, you should remember, one, you are not the first person that day to misgender them, that day, which is scary. Um, that tells you how often they're reminded of their gender. Um, but the big thing is, is that you acknowledge that you made a mistake. If I misgender somebody, um, I will simply say, I'm sorry, correct myself, and then move on. Um, so don't act like you didn't do it, right? Because that really gets on your, a lot of people's skin. When somebody calls you the wrong name repeatedly at a party and you correct them and they don't even acknowledge that they've been doing it this whole time, you get kind of annoyed. But with that being said, you don't want them to be like, overly dramatic about it either. You don't want them, you know, to throw themselves at your will and pray for your forgiveness and beg and beg and beg. No, you just want them to respect that they got your name wrong. And that happens to people all the time. Um, so when you misgender a trans person, you want to use the same kind of deliberate attitude, which is, I apologize, that was a mistake, blah, blah, blah. Fix the, fix the sentence, and then move on. Um, but do not make LGBTQ person your go-to reference on LGBTQ topics. So again, that's why this exists. Training like this exists so you can ask questions. A great, another great training tool is Google, you know, using any kind of resource that's out there. Glimma, the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association, GLAD, the Gays and Lesbians Against Defamation, um, all of these resources are out there for you to ask questions and for you to get information. But don't treat, uh, oh my God, I've, I've got a gay, I can ask them every question I ever thought of in my entire life about gay people. No, don't, don't do that to them. Because they're not, they're not, one, they're not dictionaries, uh, they're not the encyclopedia, and uh, two, you know, they get asked a lot of these questions a lot of times. Um, participate in programs for parents and allies. So, you know, that's a great way for being affirming. Get out there and actually show your public support. Um, great, all right, we're almost done. So call out people who make homophobic or transphobic comments. You know, this stuff is hard. Uh, we have a lot of conversations with people about when the moment comes, are you going to stand up for that person um, and allow that, or allow that bullying to continue? And for a gay, kid, especially for an out kid, um, either trans or um, gay or lesbian or bisexual, um, the moment where somebody backs them up and supports them is really a life altering moment for them. Um, it really changes kind of their outlook on life because they've gone from what they perceive to be a hostile environment in society their entire life. They've they begin to open up to the idea that there is an opposite push to support them. And that creates hope. And um, in my, this is me speaking off the cuff, in my estimation, hope is really what helps carry people forward, is that hope that we will um, live in a more affirmed, better supported society. The hope that there are people out there that will support us. Um, don't gossip or speculate about people's sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, I don't even do that. And I'm a member of the community. Like it is just, it's just bad, bad manners to talk about people that way. But you know, we know that gossip exists in, in society. <laughs> Be active with LGBT organizations. We already mentioned that. Make your opinions known to elected leaders and vote for elected leaders who support LGBTQ rights. 
We are not, to be clear, I don't want to be, well, yes, I do want to be overly dramatic about it. We will not, we will continue to allow LGBTQ people to kill themselves and die every year, kids to die every year until we put in place policies and elected leaders who support LGBTQ kids. It's the stats back it up. The societal data backs it up. There is nothing that refutes that uh, at all. Um, simply put, it saves children's lives to make sure there's policy. So even if that politician is not supporting LGBTQ people and you support them for a variety of other reasons, you should be pressing that elected official to support LGBTQ issues. Plenty, plenty of people have made that transition over the years. And it's mostly because they hear back from constituents, they hear back from other family members, or they have somebody directly associated with them that came out and they suddenly have this revelation on LGBT issues. Host home participation. In addition to attending this orientation, which if I didn't say it at the beginning, we honest to God cannot thank you enough uh, for taking the time. This is a great step in a positive direction. You want to read about LGBTQ people. Um, a PFLAG booklet is great. If you just Google the, the, the letters PFLAG, PFLAG will come up. It's a wonderful organization that supports caregivers of LGBTQ youth. It's wonderful to be there. Um, there's publications like the Washington Blade or Baltimore Out Loud. Those are two local regional um, uh, publications that talk about LGBT issues. Review websites. Um, the Frederick Center is a great one. You know, go us. Human Rights Campaign, PFLAG, GLSEN, Free State Justice, the National Center for Transgender Equality, the Trevor Project. There is so much out there that you can see and research and uh, to understand better about LGBT issues. Um, and you can always contact us. Um, I'm going to give you our email at the end. But, uh, you know, if you have an independent question, that's what we're here to provide the support and the answers to those questions as best we can. And when we don't know the answer, we tell you we don't know the answer because we're not promised to know everything. Um, recognize that minority stress and trauma cause what's called adverse childhood experiences, ACE. Um, ACEs is a clinical term that is recognized through all of society for children who went through traumatic childhood experiences. That is things that were life altering and actually changed the brain structure of a child. Um, and the interactions of sexual orientation and gender identity and race, national origin and other factors that come into play that might have affected what happened to a child when they were a kid that leads to um, what can later be determined as adult traumas um, and issues being able to function in society. It starts at, at childhood. Um, Planned Parenthood of Frederick, we're going to give you guys, everybody, a copy of this so you'll have all of this contact information. Um, we have a nurse practitioner on there that offers hormone replacement therapy, informed consent, I should say, on hormone replacement therapy, which is important. And um, when, and there's some notes on who to ask for there. Chase Brexton as well, um, which is a national center for uh, trans medical services. And that center is located in Ellicott City and in Baltimore. Um, and it is considered to be one of the leading resources for uh, medical support. Um, behavioral health, we have the Hartley House that is uh, for intimate partner violence, IPV and domestic violence, DV. Kate McShane is a local affirming, uh, affirmative therapist that works just with LGBTQ youth. Meredith, Meredith McAdams is the same. Sky Capucci is the same, another therapist that works specifically with lesbian, gay and bisexual youth. Same with Claire Winnick. And then Christina Poth Long. Peter is a affirmative therapist, right? Yeah, you know. I, I, I don't know if it's for LGBTQ or just LGB. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, there's also legal resources out there. Free State Justice, Maryland Legal Aid, the Frederick County Human Relations Commission. The Frederick Center was just part of a process to pass anti-discrimination language in Frederick County that makes it uh, illegal to discriminate based on sexual orientation and gender identity for housing and employment. That was a very important step forward for Frederick County. Um, so you can now contact the Frederick County Human Relations Commission if you feel that you were somehow discriminated against based on your sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, other resources is PFLAG of Central Maryland and the L Word, which is a great community um, group for the lesbian community. And then 
that's all we have for presentation. I wanted to leave 15 minutes and I got right on time. 15 minutes for questions.